in many cases, the managers have assumed, you know, we've been able to maintain high levels of productivity, things are still getting done, it's all fine. And I think we don't really understand the ways in which the cultures in many, many organizations these days are framed. So if you're a leader, if you're a manager, if you have a vision to build a company and you think algorithms are going to solve that problem for you, you're in for a big surprise. HR can't own culture and compliance can't own culture and senior leadership can't own culture. Each has a slice of culture, as do employees as a whole. So if we still think in terms of delegating to specific functions to solve these issues, I don't believe they will ever be solved. When you want to influence culture, when you want to make that a stronger part of your culture, what you need if you want to change the culture is to change people's assumptions. This is Banknotes. Banking Culture Reform. The views expressed in this podcast do not represent those of the New York Fed or the Federal Reserve System. Hello, and welcome to Season 2 of the Banking Culture Reform Podcast, part of the New York Fed's initiative to drive awareness and change in financial services culture. This season, we're exploring themes of trust, technology, and the new workplace. We introduced these topics in our 2022 webinars, which you can watch at newyorkfed.org. In this season's podcast, we've brought back panelists from each webinar to take a more in-depth look at their work around these three themes. My name is Tony DiCario, and I'm with the New York Fed's culture team. Our guest today is Allison Taylor, Executive Director of Ethical Systems and an adjunct professor at NYU Stern School of Business. Allison's also writing a book, which is focused, in her words, on how business can do the right thing in a turbulent world. Hi, Allison. Welcome. Hi, Tony. Thank you so much for having me. It's so wonderful to be here with you. Same here. Let's start out just by outlining what it is that you do. You wear many hats. Um, maybe you could describe a few of them. Sure. So the biggest hat I wear is that I'm executive director of ethical systems. And that's a research collaboration based at NYU Stern School of Business. It was founded by a prominent social psychologist called Jonathan Haidt in 2011. And I took over at the end of 2019. And the idea behind it is to bring the best ideas from academia on behavioral science and social psychology into corporate practice. So one of the things that John observed and that I also observe is that there is a lot of focus in the private sector on consulting solutions and less focus on the academic research that might actually help us build more ethical and sustainable cultures. So in terms of how I think about what I do in the world, I think about myself primarily as a translator, as someone that acts as a bridge between real life practice and real life experience and what's going on in universities and, and the, the big learnings we can have there. You mentioned also uh, I'm writing a book. So I've been interviewing lots of leaders and lots of practitioners for the last year and a half on all these big picture questions. And then I have the immense privilege of teaching at Stern on a lot of core ethics and so, uh, sustainability classes, which I think, again, really gives me this hands-on view of what's going on out there and how today's business students are thinking about these questions. Thank you for that overview. Why did you move into an organization focused on organizational culture? Why do you think organizational culture matters? And what kind of brought you to that realization? Oh, such a good question. The short answer is I've had a variety of roles, uh, mainly in consultancies, working with, on the one hand, ethics and compliance teams, legal teams, investigating fraud, doing due diligence on anti-corruption, looking at corporate integrity, looking at the background uh, of founders and companies prior to transactions and that kind of thing. More recently, I worked in sustainability sustainability, so materiality assessments, helping companies identify social and environmental priorities and trying to help uh, drive change to more responsible business. In both sets of experience, it has been very, very difficult to avoid the conclusion that culture is what really matters. So I first started to notice this 
really in the run up to the 2008 financial crisis, where I was doing a lot of anti-corruption and anti-money laundering diligence, very often for compliance teams and very often prior to a big investment banking transaction. And it was very, very hard to avoid the conclusion that the sales lead or the banker had the ability in practice to override a lot of compliance and risk checks, not by saying that they thought those were stupid, but just by undermining them and putting pushing the way that the system worked to get the result that they needed. Or I would do a fraud investigation and I would watch a senior leadership team find a convenient scapegoat to blame, even though it was quite obvious to me that there was greater knowledge of this fraud in the organization that, than the organization was prepared to admit to. And so I got very, very interested as a result of these experiences in questions of culture, because I started to see the same things happen over and over again and started to ask myself questions about what I was seeing, what I was hearing, what I was experiencing, but I didn't have the concepts to understand. And so that took me back to do a second master's in organizational psychology. After that master's, I moved into the sustainability role and many of the same questions about power, about culture, about leadership leadership, about incentives cropped up there as well. So I think in order to understand where we are with responsible business and where we might end up, you can't get away from culture. And certainly studying culture and social psychology has been more useful to me than anything else I've ever studied. It is real world tools and real world insights that I still use every day. Is there anything in particular that you think is important for financial services firms to understand about organizational culture and and kind of how and why it matters to them specifically? I mean, there's a lot of academic evidence about the kind of people that go into financial services and the specific sorts of risks that manifest in financial services. I take some of the research about the kind of personalities of people that become bankers with a bit of a pinch of salt. But this is an industry with an enormous amount of power over the rest of the economy. It's an industry that is valorized. It's an industry whose high performers are arguably excessively rewarded for their role in society. And so I think that leads to a lot of ethical pressures. There's also in financial services, particularly since the turn of the millennium, a lot of regulation. So a lot of requirements. So I think this is both a strength in financial services. You tend to see more rigor and more oversight in banking, for example, than you do in many other industries. But I think it can also lead to a a focus on process at the expense of culture, at the expense of wider organizational dynamics. And so there tends to be an idea that if we put in place the right process and the right system and the right oversight and the right carrots and sticks, our wider culture and trust problems will be addressed. And unfortunately, I think oversight processes, while they're entirely necessary, I would never say they're unimportant. They're foundational. I would describe them as necessary, but not sufficient. Right. You can have the best controls in the world, but at the end of the day, if the culture encourages people to find ways around them, they're going to find ways to do so. Exactly. I mean, it's been very, very useful to me, and this is part of what I'm trying to write about in this book. It's very useful, I think, to think about a lot of these efforts as as sort of defense mechanisms to deflect either the regulator or to deflect reputational risk. And so there tends to be more of a focus on protecting the value of the organization from these perceived negative threats from the outside than actually doing what it takes to build an ethical sustainable culture where you perhaps wouldn't need so many defenses because you'd have more societal trust. That's a great segue, actually. So the the three topics that we at New York Fed have been looking at this year with reference to culture are trust, technology, and the new workplace. But you moderated our most recent web panel on culture in the new workplace. Um, So I'd love first to get your perspective on a couple of learnings for you. Is there anything that you talked about in that session or that you thought about in preparing for that session related to how kind of our post-pandemic world 
is impacting culture and the way that we interact with one another? What are you kind of still thinking about? I mean, the first thing I want to say is it was such a wonderful panel and anyone that is listening to this right now and hasn't listened to that panel, I highly recommend that you do so. Three amazing people, amazing academics, amazing experience. And each of them did a lot to push me on my prior assumptions. And I certainly walked away with very different conclusions that I walked uh, in with. So I think the first thing I would say is I had the assumption assumption that a remote culture might be a culture with weaker signals and a culture uh, where it is uh, less easy to make employees aware of what your priorities are and what your values are. But what the panelists showed me is actually culture can be stronger. Culture can even, uh, or technology rather, can even come further into your home. It can make the organization feel more present. It can create new kinds of dynamics and new kinds of ways of behaving. So it's not just a case of remote culture is weaker and in-person culture is stronger, but there are entirely new considerations if you move to a remote or a hybrid way of thinking. The second uh, piece of insight from the panel, I think, was about the need to experiment. And this is very much in line with ethical systems own mission. But the panelists repeatedly emphasized that we're in this uh, unprecedented time where we don't really uh, know what's going to happen next. We're dealing with a lot of things that have never happened before. For. And we all, I think, collectively focused on the, the tendency of a lot of CEOs, perhaps particularly in financial services, to say, this is the way it's going to be. This is the way my culture is. I'm going to make this decision about remote work or incentives or hiring, and it will have this impact. And I think what we all agreed was we don't actually know. So there is a need to do proper behavioral experimental research in real organizations. There is far less of that around than there should be. We do a lot of A-B testing and so on to try and make people buy more, but much less to try and make our cultures, to try and make our ethics, uh, to try and make our leadership more effective. So really, I think it really made a strong case for experimental research and, and working with academic partners. And then thirdly, and perhaps most significantly, I have this view of technology and surveillance as very dystopian and very disturbing. And the panelists convinced me that really, this is a set of tools that could be used to drive far more positive culture. It could be used to empower employees. It could be used to solve a lot of the problems from the past. We're not necessarily doomed to this dystopian future of all being plugged into a matrix and, and, and surveilled to death. So where I really landed was feeling much, much more optimistic that if we could get these insights and tools into the hands of leaders with the appropriate thoughts and the appropriate priorities, we would be in a much, much better position to weather some of the storms out there at the moment. I think maybe first I'll pick up on your comment that now we can bring the office into the home more. I know that you have some views on that. There's been kind of a trend in the last few years of bringing your whole self to work. But I think that you've identified maybe some pitfalls associated with that. Can you talk a little bit about your perspective on kind of the strengths and weaknesses, perhaps, of bringing your whole self to work, and particularly as it relates to ethical and unethical behavior and how it might impact people's motivations? Sure. So the first thing I want to say about this topic is that I think the notion of bringing your whole self to work comes from a really, really, really positive place. It's very much tied to diversity and inclusion considerations. It's very much tied to the idea that if you don't feel you can be your whole self in the office, if you are hiding some aspect of yourself, of your social identity, let's take an obvious example, your sexuality, then you will not be able to participate fully in the culture. You are also less likely to raise your voice when you have ethical concerns, you are less likely to feel included. So I think all of this comes from an incredibly positive place of trying to make organizational culture uh, more relevant and more appropriate and more comfortable for every employee and not, not just a particular subset of employees. And I see this in the classroom every day to see that young people expect more from their careers than I did at their age, to see that they expect to have a contribution, they expect just work somewhere that has a positive contribution to society. And I think all of that is really awesome and in, in strong contrast to how I felt, which was that it was all about getting told what to do until you had enough power to tell other people what to do. So having said all of that, I see a lot of surveys and a lot of discussion out there 
about how employees today expect corporations to align with their personal values and expect them to speak up on questions that they feel passionate about. And unfortunately, I think that is going nowhere good because it is somewhere between difficult and impossible, I would say, for any corporation today to accurately reflect the personal values of all its employees. In fact, it's an it's an obviously absurd aspiration. Our values are personal, they are high varied. There is probably less of a global consensus on core values than there, there has been certainly in my lifetime. And so how we would expect any global corporation to reflect the personal values of all its employees, I have, I have no idea. Um, and so I think it puts companies in a bind. It exposes them to risks of hypocrisy and unrealistic expectations. And I think it's also in some cases, and certainly in the US context, helping to increase polarization and helping to further uh, confuse us on the role of business in society. So what I would rather see corporations do is have maybe less um, of an appetite to impose a set of values on all their employees, which is by definition going to make some group of employees feel silenced and overridden and resentful and as if there's a dominant culture. I think it's far more important to encourage pluralism, to encourage mutual respect, to encourage conflict resolution, critical thinking. And so rather than maybe taking a stand on the controversial social or political issue of the day, you provide employees time off to vote. You allow them to use their own salaries to speak up and fund whatever causes they believe. And so I think we've gone too far in expecting corporations to fulfill a role we used to expect from governments. And I think we are in some cases causing further conflict and fragmentation inside our organizations than we need to. What I would personally do if I was a CEO today is say, if you want to thrive and be senior in this organization, I need to see you work successfully with somebody with very, very different values from you and who you may even personally dislike. I also would kind of close by saying I would like to shut my front door at night and know that my employer is not going to come into my house and know what I'm going to do. So maybe where we need to go is uh, don't bring your whole self to work and we won't bring HR into your home. So picking up on on kind of another uh, of the learnings that you talked about, which is the idea of experimentation that we don't actually know what the right mix is between virtual and in-person work. We don't actually know who should be working with whom and where and why and how that impacts culture. It's different for every organization, I think is one of the big takeaways I had from that session that you moderated brilliantly, by the way. But I think that there is a real resistance to experimentation. Um, I think this is particularly true actually in highly regulated industries like banking, but true anywhere where it is a careful trapeze act to be seen as experimenting with your employees, right? But you have a lot of experience with this ethical systems. And what is it that kind of resonates with people and and gets them over that hump and willing to try new things and maybe make a mistake. I mean, I don't think it's super easy to encourage any private sector organization to do this kind of research. When I'm trying to persuade an organization that this is a good idea, I emphasize that they will have the benefit of academic rigor. They will have the benefit of independence. Anything they do will be documented. We would try something with a control group. We would be able to measure before and after. So one big selling point is it will stop you wasting maybe millions of dollars on, for example, DEI training that doesn't work um, and and have some, some hope of designing something that might work better and might actually improve inclusion. But you also talk about how difficult it is to experiment in areas like compliance or like ESG, where there's so much reputational and regulatory pressure and perhaps a nervousness with, you know, we're experimenting with our compliance program that already sounds really risky. There is an idea in sociology called isomorphism. And I think you see this very, very strongly in compliance and in sustainability is that firms are essentially copying each other 
and herding together to try and prevent regulatory scrutiny. And I think it's really stopping us progressing. So there are ways to design experimental research that are ethical. They're not creepy. They don't involve violating employees' privacy. I certainly think it would be important to have rigorous academic partners to do that. But I think that we've reached a limit in terms of how we can progress on any of these issues if we just keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Isomorphism, I like that concept. I have to admit to not knowing it um, before you mentioned it. It makes me think about kind of the challenge that many industries face. I'm sure this isn't limited to financial services, but I know that in financial services, there is a, a kind of a collective action problem when it comes to culture and behavior, because there's so much movement among and between organizations that you kind of have an industry culture as much as you have an individual firm culture. So how can firms assert a different approach to culture kind of within that collective action problem, if you will, and make it like a a strategic strength? I think it's true in all industries to some degree, but I certainly had a client from banking a few years ago who said we like to walk across the street together holding hands. And I think because of the regulatory pressure, there's certainly a very, very big driver to kind of herd together and and not put your head above the parapet. And that's incredibly understandable. One solution would be collective action. You see that also on on things like climate with GFANS. So getting companies to sign up to the same approach, to do the same kind of culture assessment, to share findings. Obviously, there are antitrust considerations, but they are not insurmountable and so on. So I think that's really, really positive. I mean, something I certainly see is that there is more emphasis on culture and conduct risk, thanks partly to the Fed, but more emphasis on these questions than there is in many, many other industries. And so I think you are starting from a really, really good base. I would say it's financial services and pharmaceuticals that have gone the furthest here, that have gone furthest in hiring behavior behavioral scientists that have gone furthest in bringing in these insights. So certainly not starting from scratch and certainly in a much, much stronger position than other industries. But I think differentiation and trying to do anything truly innovative is going to continue to be a struggle. You talked about um, folks in banking having brought in uh, behavioral scientists um, to help them with this work. You sitting in your seat at Ethical Systems bring a super wide range of perspectives to bear on this issue. You have members that are sociologists, organizational psychologists, economists, accountants, who are kind of all bringing a different perspective and indeed bring a necessary perspective. You kind of need to be able to see it from many different angles. There are many ways to skin the cat, if you will. Obviously, a single organization can't bring in folks with all of those different perspectives to kind of help them solve their unique problems. So what do you see as effective ways for an organization trying to attack culture as something that can be formed and influenced, how do they bring all this to bear when facing this huge amount of literature? So I think this is, you've kind of really, with your question, expressed some of the problems with culture, which is that it's perceived to be almost impossible to measure. And it's perceived to be not just complex, but sort of fluffy and soft compared to other things we might do around structure or process or things that are much easier to understand easier for the average business to implement. So I think that's all a shame because if you would get culture right, all these other things would likely fix themselves. So it's not easy to answer your question with a um, a kind of pat couple of pieces of recommendations, but I think a very good place to start is just by trying to measure your culture and not measure it in the sense of I want to have a score and I want to understand what I how I compare to my peer banks and where I'm higher or lower and how I can improve my score, but understand kind of some key points about how the culture works, how employees feel about their roles, how employees feel about their bosses, how comfortable employees would feel speaking up and so on. And so I would, Tony, just point any listener to, there's a a page on the Ethical Systems website where we have summarized uh, what we know of as being the best available culture, ethical culture assessments out there. We've done a link to all of them. We've done a review of them. And so that would be a really, really good place to start. If you could get a baseline measure of where you are, then you will be able to understand and track change and progress over time. And from there, 
there, maybe start to think about what themes are recurring, are different themes arising in different regions, in different groups, in different product lines, in different teams, and then how might we go about improving some of the issues that are being identified? So the short answer is we're not going to be able to change or improve anything if we don't know what the current situation is and can't measure it. So the first step is always to measure culture and, and have some curiosity about what's going on in your organization. And then it's not as mysterious and not as fluffy as people think. So going back to new ways of working and how culture and the transmission of culture has maybe changed in the last couple of years, can you give us some perspective on whether there are kind of different expectations now around acceptable behaviors? And I ask this specifically in the context of, you know, news articles that we've seen about firms that have ended up paying pretty hefty fines for the use of unauthorized channels to conduct business. Is there something about our new approach to work that's perhaps normalized some behaviors that weren't considered okay in the past? I think certainly the shift to remote work has created some dilemmas. It's created some additional opportunities for unethical behavior. It has also created additional opportunities for intrusive surveillance. So I think setting and conveying culture and being much more explicit about your expectations and really focusing on what it takes to be a good team manager are real imperatives in a way that I guess they've always been, but there are things you can do in a physical environment as a manager. There are things you can do in terms of oversight that are more difficult in a remote or hybrid environment. The other thing that's very, very much on my mind is changing expectations about work from younger generations. So millennials, first of all, and now Gen Z, and we talked a little bit about this on the webinar, but we have at this point, anybody under 26 does not have that much experience, if any, of working you know, in a normal, what we used to consider a normal pre-COVID office environment. And I think that combined with these possibly unrealistic expectations about what work and leadership and jobs are for and the increased ability and willingness of young people to raise concerns and possibly unrealistic demands is all coming to, to maybe mean that uh, management has never been so difficult. And I'm hearing this over and over again in daily conversations that today your 25-year-old intern or your new hire will be quite comfortable challenging the CEO in a town hall meeting about, you know, the mix, the diversity mix on the senior leadership team. I've heard that across countries. And I think it's it's pretty jaw-dropping for anyone my age to, to think of challenging power in that way. So on the one hand, there's this huge opportunity with this rise of voice to kind of treat this as an advantage, to identify products you're going to necessarily uh, miss just because you have a lot of power at the top. On the other hand, um, I'm also frequently hearing that there's a lot of entitlement. There's a lot of unwillingness to adapt to the culture. There's a lot of, for example, feeling like I would like to be able to have the schedule and work from where I like, but I would like to also have all the benefits of the in-person culture and the kind of mentorship and encouragement. And so not maybe a very realistic view of the trade-off. So I conclude really by uh, feeling quite grateful that I'm not managing a big team these days, but I think we need to do a lot more to support managers and middle managers in particular. I also think um, we've emphasized over the last few years sort of strategic inspirational leadership at the expense of just good hands-on competent management. And I really think we need to go back there and provide today's managers with better tools and better approaches to navigate some of these challenges. That's really interesting. I, I, I have been thinking myself lately about how our experiences, particularly in the last couple of years, even non-Gen Z folks like us are so bespoke. And you know, the, the, there's been research done by Microsoft, which is cited by lots of people, showing that our world has become smaller. Our ties with the people that we're close to, that we talk to a lot, have grown stronger but our kind of what, what they call weak ties, you know, there are, we have fewer of them and we've become much more kind of siloed. And so I'm curious about how that's impacting organizations' ability to kind of influence via large social groups, 
because we are so bespoke. And you talked about how kind of the next generation comes in and they want their specific values to be reflected. Well, they all have different values. And so I'm curious about whether the way that we influence behavior is the way that we influence kind of acceptable and unacceptable behaviors has maybe shifted. I think this is is sort of like the ultimate philosophical question, but I think uh, I'm back to this sort of notion of how difficult it is now to set values from the top down. My impression is there's more CEO town halls and kind of company-wide meetings, and then everybody goes back into their tiny teams. And what we're not doing as well as we used to maybe, and not that I don't think we've ever done it particularly well, is work across silos and take a kind of whole organization perspective. That's unfortunate because most of the most pressing and difficult problems facing organizations today aren't anyone's job to deal with. So whether it's deciding what social or political issues to speak up on, whether it's thinking about ethics beyond compliance, whether it's thinking about how you can contribute uh, more positively to society and set environmental and social goals, whether it is about detecting wrongdoing, All of these things require cross-functional collaboration and someone thinking about risks in a much, much more holistic way. I think we need more of a focus on holistic integrity. I've, I've worked on this for a long time, but closer connections between marketing, public affairs, HR, compliance, ethics, ESG, more strategic thinking about integrity and ethics. And then I think a lot of private sector organizations would really benefit from academic help and support and measurement and understanding what is going on out there and also understanding these aren't issues confined to one organization. Pretty much everybody is struggling with them and we all need to collectively come up with better approaches, uh, which I don't think will be achieved if we just use the old tools and, and tired old assumptions we've been using from before the pandemic. What is holistic integrity? I think it is about thinking about the connections between the voluntary and the regulated and thinking coherently about, for example, it is not sufficient to have even a leading sustainability program with a great materiality assessment and all the disclosures out there. If you haven't, for example, given thought to your political contributions and given thought to what you're going to speak on publicly. And so... The default, I think, is to give, you know, compliance, one set of issues, sustainability, another set of issues, risk, another set of issues, senior leadership, another set of issues, strategy, another set of issues, HR, another set of issues. But we can only make sense of some of these questions if we can think across those functions. And so a very obvious thing we've been talking about so far on this podcast is organizational culture. Well, HR can't own culture and compliance can't own culture and senior leadership can't own culture. Each has a slice of culture, as do employees as a whole. So if we still think in terms of delegating to specific functions to solve these issues, I don't believe they will ever be solved. That's what I mean by holistic integrity is thinking more about working across the organization and making some of these questions the responsibility of the senior leadership team so we can put in place the right governance mechanisms to at least think through and and make our best effort on answering these questions. And that way you also make it kind of more of an institutional thing. Like it's, it's, it's more kind of embedded throughout the institution, which is relevant because I'm, I'm now thinking about the great resignation, which maybe is a myth. People are saying now, I I don't know. Um, I'm sure you, you know better than I, is it real? And if so, how is it impacting firms ability to influence behavior as you have, as much churn and turnover as people have these days. There's been a ton of churn and turnover and in some cases also exponential growth. So I also know a lot of firms that have grown substantially during the pandemic. People don't know each other. People aren't used to the culture and so on. On the great resignation, I mean, there's a lot of data from surveys and so on out there. There's also some evidence that things like long COVID are really affecting the workforce. So I think it's a a, a pretty murky picture. But I think 
perhaps this is another example of of a failure or a, a, a weakness in thinking holistically about culture and holistically about employee motivation. I, what I tend to see is a lot of CEO rhetoric around purpose and mission. And I have the impression that all these CEOs have read a lot of surveys showing that more dedicated, passionate employees are more productive. But you've seen all this rhetoric that's very, very grandiose in a lot of cases, advancing along with employees feeling apparently less motivated, apparently less committed, apparently more exploited, apparently on email at 11 p.m. at night. And so we are possibly trying to use a lot of rhetoric about purpose and mission that we feel will attract investors or deflect scrutiny in some way without first concentrating on the basics of dignity and respect and employee satisfaction. And so I think we need to focus on these more basic issues that we need to walk before we can run, maybe is one way to put it. I think it is less important that you have some kind of a noble sounding societal goal and more that you have superordinate goals and that employees feel some level of pride in what they're doing every day. And so I think we've a little bit lost sight of some of those basics. Uh, the good news, meaning if any company can get all of that right, I think it would provide a significant source of strategic advantage today. What are your thoughts on kind of whether there have been any opportunities raised either through the introduction and, and acceptance of more and more technology between us or the kind of global experience of all of us going home and now coming back to work? Are there any opportunities that kind of came up that you think could still be harnessed? And I guess I'll, I'll add to that question just an observation that I think there are many people generally and especially in financial services who want to go back to kind of the way things were, you know, who are going back um, to be in the office full time. And my observation is even if we're all in the office, the way that we interact with one another has really changed. And that's probably not going anywhere. Even if we're all in the office, we're still using technology much more than we were before. We're much more likely to use Slack or Teams to communicate with one another than we are to pick up the phone, which kind of pre-pandemic, we were probably more likely to pick up the phone, or at least those of us in older generations who hadn't embraced technology yet. And so where do you see kind of the opportunities that exist for everyone, even those that are kind of more traditional organizations? I mean, I think the big opportunity is to redesign work so that we are making the best use of the time that we need to spend together, whether it's to generate ideas or get to know each other or, you know, work on something strategic together versus what we are best placed having the freedom to do at home on our own. And so there's a huge opportunity, but to take advantage of that opportunity means really looking at every single person's job role, understanding what they do all day, understanding what part of that can only be achieved through in-person collaboration, what part of it is best to leave the employee to work on their own behalf. And so it's not a case that you just, uh, my impression is a lot of organizations have defaulted to two, three days a week in person, wherever you feel like it. And then people end up sitting in the office with lots of Zoom feedback on other people's computers. You could design a better workplace where you have physical spaces, where you are bringing employees together for the activities that are really, really important for them to do together and otherwise allowing them to live in other places, visit other places, work more freely, take care of family obligations. It's obviously a huge opportunity to advance on DEI goals. It could give people with family obligations more flexibility, more ability to achieve. There's some evidence that more kind of toxic diversity dynamics or leadership dynamics show up less in remote environments. So we get more of a focus on competence and which employees can actually deliver rather than which just sort of talk a good game in meetings. So the tools are all there. The thinking is all there. In fact, from technology, the insights are potentially all there. But those insights need to be put in someone's hands that know what to do with them and know how to use them for the collective good. So 
it's an all opportunity, I think, for, for an organization that does that. If you don't think deliberately about this, if you just kind of default and align with what everybody else is doing and, again, kind of try and apply ideas from before, then I don't think you will take advantage of these great developments. And I think probably the net result will be worse than it was before the pandemic. So there's bigger upside and bigger downside, I would say. Okay, so you are placed at Ethical Systems in a seat where you see so much work being done on questions related to ethics, related to organizational behavior, um, to incentives. So I want to kind of dig into some resources with you because you are an excellent source of information about resources. So if I, if I were a bank executive who has just entered a new organization, have want to get my head around what is organizational culture, I'd love to hear your take on the best resources to bone up on in order to approach that. And then moving into once I've been able to fully understand the culture that I'm dealing with or the set of cultures that I'm dealing with, what are the best resources for me to consult in thinking about how to shape and influence um, organizational culture, particularly when it comes to ethical behavior and ethical decision making? I mean, there's a lot of resources out there. There is a a really good reading list that we created maybe a year or so ago with really good behavioral science resources aimed at ethics leaders that I will share and we can have in the in the show notes. That's books, it's articles, it's podcasts. It's all stuff that I think is clear and compelling and you don't need all the jargon to understand. So one of the really great things about this field is there's so many amazing, vivid writers. It's not like trying to get to grips with regulatory compliance or accounting or something like that. These are, I think, concepts and ways of thinking that are familiar to everybody. They're often in popular discourse. These ideas shouldn't be viewed as impenetrable as they tend to be. I'd certainly be paying attention to the New York Fed's culture and behavior sessions. I think I would be looking to get some advice and some strategic partnerships to try and kind of put some of these ideas into practice. So, you know, I think my key takeaway is really that there's a lot out there that is is accessible and is helpful and there's more and more being developed every day. And so no need to feel intimidated, no need to feel that this is uh, outside your normal skill set. I had a professor at Columbia that said you don't change culture by trying to change culture. So very often what you need to do to change a culture is not kind of more happy hours and free ping pong and yoga apps. You need to look at things like incentives and oversight and power and rewards and then the culture will change. Microsoft is a very, very good example recently of of a new leader who really came in and very deliberately changed the culture and specifically moved the company from a focus on individual results to team performance and behavior. So it can be done. It can be done quite quickly. It just requires a bit of thought and a bit of planning. Um, And again, uh, not to sound like a broken record, but experimentation and measurement are not just throwing spaghetti against the wall and saying what sticks. I think that sums it up perfectly. I will end it there. Thank you so much, Allison, for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. If you want to hear more from Allison, watch the New York Fed's webinar on culture in the new workplace, which you'll find at newyorkfed.org slash governance and culture reform.